U.S. Embassy Islamabad for opening remarks. Monica is a regional public engagement specialist in Islamabad and in charge of American space in Pakistan and Afghanistan. She previously worked two years in the public affairs section of Messi Islamabad on social media and special projects. She also served in Mexico, Cambodia as a cultural affair officer. Before joining the foreign service, Monica was a civil servant and worked on Africa related issues. Where she, she spent years in South Sudan witnessing the independence of the world's youngest country. She speaks general Spanish and Khmer and is from Georgetown, Texas. Please give a very warm welcome to Ms. Monica. Over to you, Monica. Thank you, Hina, and good afternoon, everyone. Assalamu alaikum. Um, it's my honor to welcome you to today's webinar on the right to religious freedom. So the reason we're organizing this webinar today is because um, this weekend on January 16th is something called National Religious Freedom Day. This is um, particularly a, a day observed in the United States and it commemorates the Virginia uh, General Assembly's adoption of Thomas Jefferson's landmark Virginia Statue for Religious Freedom. And that was way back in 1786. Um, so th that statute, that's, um, that law um, became the basis for um, the First Amendment of the US Constitution and led to um, religious freedom for all Americans. Um, so I just wanted to give a little bit of that context as to why we're holding this um, program today. Um, so it's an important topic in the United States. Um, and I hope you all will ask many questions. We have uh, two great panelists today, so I don't want to take up a lot of time because I want you to hear from, from them, from their expertise, and to be able to ask a lot of questions to them. Um, so I hope you'll have a great discussion with them this afternoon, and thanks so much for attending. That's it. Thanks. Back over to you, Hina. Thank you so much, Monica. Moving onward, let me introduce to our speaker for today's program. Our first guest is Dr. Iqbal Akhtar. He's an associate professor, uh, professor with a dual appointment in the Department of Religious Studies and the Political and International Relations in the Stephen J. Green School of International and Public Affairs. He's completed his de uh, doctorate at the University of Edinburgh's New College Schools of Divinity. His, work, his current work explored the origin of the Fajr people in the subcontinent through extant oral tradition known as Khani in Sindhi, Gujarati, and Hindustani. Our second guest is Peer Sayyid Mudassir Nazar Shah. He is the Sajda Nishin of Tabari Aliyah Saroba Sharif in Jhelum district. He is serving his community, country, and inner obligation by leading his, leading his socially and politically active life. He is the co-chairman of Netherlands-based Universal Sufi Council. Mr. Shah is lobbyist and also founder of and president of Sluk and Islamabad based Sufi think tank established in October 2014. Sluk is dedicated to research on their inner dimension of Islam and the current religious, religious discourse in Pakistan and promoting religious collaboration, peaceful coexistence, universal brotherhood and sisterhood and inner and outer harmony in Pakistan. I welcome you both. Now we begin the program proceeding, and I would like to hand over the, panel, the floor to our guests to please share your thoughts on the importance of religious freedom tolerance from their perspective. First, I would like to invite Dr. Akbar. Okay, assalamu alaikum everyone. Uh, it's uh, an honor and a pleasure to be here. Um, thank you all for inviting me. Um, uh, to all, you know, Monica, Hina, everyone that's here, Pierre Saab, um, thank you so much for having me, uh, Maria. So my, uh, I'll share uh, just my my slides very quickly. Um, I know we don't. I hope everyone can see that. Um, so this is just to let you know. I'm currently, um, and just to give you sort of an idea, a little bit about myself. Um, I'm currently here in um, Pakistan as a Fulbright scholar. Um, so uh, as you know, the Fulbright uh, program has been around for about 75 years and it focuses on interaction um, between uh, people in the United States and in Pakistan. 
Um, and so I'm very lucky to have been one of the few scholars to be selected to come to Pakistan in the last couple of years. Um, and then, you know, every year, a couple hundred uh, uh, people at a time are in the United States from Pakistan on that program. And so part of what the Fulbright is trying to do is just trying to develop connections between both societies and to be able to um, improve the capacity of each country. So of Pakistan to be able to develop itself as a, as a modern nation state and for the United States to better understand the complexity of um, South Asia and other parts of the world. Um, so I teach at Florida International University, um, which is the main public university uh, in the United States um, for Miami within the state of Florida system. And uh, my focus is in religious studies and in politics and international relations. So I have degrees in, in both fields. Um, and that's sort of something that's of, of important interest to me. So per, particularly public education and thinking about how education can help shift and change a society's way of understanding itself and others. So the first question that we come across, and this is part of my research here in Pakistan, is how do we define the idea of Pakistan as a society? So is it a, you know, we're constantly told that Qaeda Azam and Allah Iqbal had the vision for Pakistan. But do we understand really what that vision was or what did it really look like? Um, and so that's the larger question. Was it a, is, is Pakistan an Islamic state or is it a Muslim nation? And each of these, the answers to each of these questions gives you very different ways of thinking about what the society would look like. Part of why the answer is important is that if it's a society for Muslims um, or is it run on religious principles, then the answer for that then really then thinks about that it, it opens the question, what is the space for non-Muslim minorities? And so that's a big question for us. So if Pakistan is to be a multicultural society, it's a society that's supposed to um, be a place of uh, religious tolerance, it's a place where diversity is valued, then what is the space and place for, for non-Muslim minorities? Um, and particularly the larger question than the fundamental question that we have within Pakistan, if you open any Pakistan studies textbook, would be that you have a few pages devoted to the pre-Islamic past. So thousands of years in just three pages or so, and then it starts with uh, the birth of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi and then um, Muhammad bin Qasim and sort of the Islamic period in, the, in, in partition. And really thousands of years of history are relegated to sort of irrelevance in a way to the story of Pakistan. And so the, the question then becomes how do we integrate the pre-Islamic past and the Muslim present in a way that celebrates both and, it, and understands and admits that the Islamic present also has an obligation to the pre-Islamic past and that all people here, the culture, the language, the society, the civilization um, has elements from the past. So this picture um, that's here is actually from um, Qatas at the uh, one of the most important sort of sites of Hinduism uh, before partition. Um, here's the, uh, this is the Gurdwara at uh, Punjab. Um, and so the question then becomes, you know, why are we in a situation where there is a tremendous amount of intolerance? Like, so the first picture that I had here, this was actually, I took in Sialkot. So I had gone to, um, to interview people there. And, um, you know, again, this is sort of something that the government of um, uh, the, the district council in Sialkot put up. Um, to celebrate sort of Christmas, right? The, a Christian um, Sri Lankan had been killed uh, a few weeks earlier. And I mean, it was clear that it was kind of a trumped up blasphemy charges, right? Um, so that's kind of the larger question is sort of what's fueling the problem, right? So how do we first understand the problem? One of the, the issue we think about is the, the political power of hate. So that's one of the things that we see in, in all societies, including the United States, right? That hating others can very quickly galvanize people um, politically to get votes, right? So that's one problem. And that's, of course, that's a general problem uh, within humanity itself, right? The second, I think, problem also is as we think about the Pakistan, Pakistan as a culture, as a society has also lost a lot with the loss of its non-Muslim minorities. So a city like I'm in, I'm in Lahore right now. Lahore is an ancient city. 
It has tremendous history that goes back to the Hindu periods, the Jain periods, the Sikh periods. All these periods of history um, are encapsulated within the city of Lahore. Majority of it's gone. The last Jain community, and I work on Jainism as well, the Jain, the Jain religion, um, the Jain community left uh, four years ago was the last family had left. So there's no longer a resident Jain community in Lahore. I mean, that's, I think, I feel like that these are very sad things, right? I've met, you know, people from the Parsi community, from other communities. I mean, they're all dwindling in the country and they had great contributions to the history of these cities, right? Um, even think about uh, the, our, cuisine, for instance, there's very little of a celebration of vegetarian cuisine, right, in Pakistan. It's, it tends to be a meat-centric sort of society, but Lahore had a, a thriving vegetarian culture and in, 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 in sort of cuisine that doesn't exist anymore, right? So in many ways, the loss of that. And then the question is, what was the violence that was done within that? And I think that that's a very important question because the violence that was done by non-Muslims to Muslims and Muslims to non-Muslims is a legacy that haunts the way that Pakistan defines itself. And then confronting the reality of that violence is extremely important in moving forward. So when we think about places like South Africa who had gone through apartheid, they had a truth and reconciliation uh, uh, commission, and that helped at least at some level to be able to admit what had happened in terms of the violence and the atrocities and being able to move forward, right? Um, so that's part of kind of what, you know, the, some of the challenges, I think. Of course, there's also the legacy of domestic violence within the country, so the domination of Punjab over the other uh, provinces as well, um, and what that means for um, minority communities that are here that are Muslim. So it's not just about talking about non-Muslims, it's also talking about minority perspectives within the world of Islam and how those uh, that diversity is understood. Of course, the politicization of Islam after, particularly after the 1979 uh, Islamic revolution and kind of how that changed the balance, the war in Afghanistan has had a huge impact on um, destabilizing sort of the traditional uh, political culture of Pakistan, and then the larger issue of, of education in terms of how um, for a middle income country, Pakistan is actually very high in terms of the numbers of people that are uneducated. And education in the definitions of Pakistan are, are very simple in terms of you know, someone being able to read and write, uh, to write their own name, right? So just the level of education for a, a large society and particularly for women is very low. And then that also kind of creates its own challenges in terms of being able to, to foster that sort of um, diversity. But whatever the challenges that Pakistan has, I feel like this moment in the history of Pakistan is an important moment. And I feel that it presents us very unique opportunities um, to develop this idea of sort of, of tolerance uh, and religious pluralism. One is that you have an, a new urban educated middle class that's coming up in all of the major cities and the provincial capitals. New private universities are augmenting traditional uh, public universities, um, like University of Central Punjab here in Lahore, um, uh, UMT, where I'm working at, uh, University of Management Technology. Um, also, scholars are working on these topics, trying to uncover new narratives of history, thinking about um, non-Muslim minorities, uh, people from lower class backgrounds, what are the different versions and stories of history that exist? The stories of women, the stories of different groups um, to provide critical analysis of that history. We know that CPEC and the new um, economic corridor that's going to be, uh, that's being built in Pakistan is going to bring new people, new resources into Pakistan. That's an opportunity. Um, thinking about the opening up of Pakistan um, to diversity. Um, we've seen with the ending of the war in Afghanistan, a decrease in domestic terrorism and instability in Pakistan. That is means that there is more opportunity and more space for the dialogues and the discussions that we're having now. And then also the current national government, Imran Khan's government, whatever your opinion of his government is, they are very clearly committed to inclusivity and religious harmony. And that's also, that's great momentum, at least at the federal level that we're seeing. And the last slide that I wanted to share with you is a little bit about my own perspective growing up in America. So I was born in uh, New Orleans in Louisiana and I grew up in rural Louisiana. Um, and 
My father's family is from uh, Chakwal originally. My mother's family is Koja from East Africa, from Tanzania, but originally they're from Indian Gujarat, uh, Kutch and Katiawar. Uh, and so I've, you know, I've done work in Africa and in, in past. We see America as a society developing as a multicultural society really only in the 1960s. In the 1970s. So with the changing of immigration laws in 1965, then people from Africa and Asia were able to come. And so I grew up in a society where in greater New Orleans, you had seven or eight mosques, right? And this is a Christian uh, dominant, Christian majority country society, um, but you have this respect for religious diversity. You also had racial tensions. Okay, I think I, I lost it for a minute there. I think we um, lost the, yeah, the screen share. There you go. Is it good? Yeah, good now. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so I grew up in uh, Louisiana, and um, there you also had, it was it was a society that was coming out of uh, segregation into integration. And so you, you saw the changing nature of what it meant to be an American was shifting. Um, into more multicultural sort of modes, right? So you had the end of the Vietnam War, a huge influx of Vietnam, Vietnamese refugees came into New Orleans. Um, with After Hurricane Katrina, uh, many uh, Hispanic Americans, particularly Mexican heritage that have come in, into the New Orleans area. So we see that the society is diversifying in many ways. Miami as a country is a minority majority uh, city. So the majority people in uh, um, the Hispanic Americans. Right? So you see tremendous diversity in terms of what it means to be American, but that's also still being contested at the national level between Democrats and Republicans, between different groups within each of these political parties. So I think that that's what I wanted to sort of explain is that um, it is possible to have a multicultural society, that, but that is a work in progress. Even in an established democracy like the United States, it's still a work in progress. I also grew up in the aftermath of 9-11, and had many different challenges there. So I think that's kind of the larger question that I wanted to pose to our Pakistani colleagues and our students that are here is what type of multicultural society can come out of the Pakistan that they see today. So with that, I wanted to thank you for this opportunity. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Iqbal. It's a pleasure to hear you and the, the sentence you have used that if we have diversity values, then there should be equal rights for minorities. So the same questions for Pete Mudassisa. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Hina. Uh, thank you, Monica, for giving me this opportunity to speak with this such a uh, such a wonderful uh, forum. Uh, I will start with the religion. Uh, the core question is religion. Oh, the understanding of religion which we all carry with ourselves what is religion what is religion for us and how we see our religious values uh, and its importance in our day-to-day -day life a religion is very hard to describe it has a description and a story of each individual which he or she carries with himself herself they explain it in their own way. I'm not talking about the academic way uh, how Dr. Uh, Iqbal Akhtar addressed the issue. I am uh, a person who is more uh, connected with the soil of the soul, uh, with the soil, and my soul is more connected with the soil. So I, uh, I will uh, speak in a very open manner on uh, core understandings of society about this particular issue. We need to realize one thing that religion is very important. Religion is very important. And I'm talking about religion. I'm not talk talking about my religion, your religion. In generally, religion is very important. Religion is very important for me. Religion is very important for you. We just need to understand that how we are giving importance to our religion in the same manner, the other one is giving importance to his or her religion. So let's begin with 
giving space to others for their religions only that much which we want to claim for ourselves it's very simple it's very simple i want to celebrate my religion within and outside so let's give them space to celebrate their religions within and outside i want my religion to be respected so let's start giving respect to other religious ideologies and if we talk about the religious differences and the core debates of uh, or intellectual debates on religions those are taking place for centuries and trust me nothing came out trust me why not start exploring the cultural values of the religion the cultural aspect of the religion every religion has its own cultural values i believe that there are cultural religions there is a side of religion which is purely cultural um, i i i have nothing to do what with uh, what concept of baba shiva god allah lord buddha you are following i am very much connected with my own concepts and those concepts are very dear to me so the basic understanding which i have to develop that equally giving you the space to love the concepts you are carrying with yourself that's very simple and when we talk about the religious diversity there is a certain flavored connectivity between religious cultural values and i would like you to invite to start reclaiming the cultural relig- uh, religious diversity for example we are living in a and right now these are the they they call it lori uh, celebrations in punjab and they are very much dear to sikh uh, families but equally punjabi muslims they like to celebrate it diwali is there shabirat is there rabi lawal is there christmas is there muharram is there so if if you take an example of muharram you will find there are so many hindus sikhs christians who follow the muharram in the same manner muslims or even asna ashri shias followed that you talk about christmas i would love to enjoy the christmas eve with my friends i cannot forget the easter cakes which i used to receive from my christian friends when on the easter uh, day and so on and so on the challenge is politicization of religion and using religion as a power tool for most of the times for uh, ruling elite that is the challenge which we need to understand that differences between religions were never our challenge we were the people as as human being as the citizen of global planet we were the people who used to enjoy it for centuries the politicization of religion which was used in wars political claims political disputes claiming powers uh reshuffling regimes that is a visible part of human history and unfortunately now uh, it became more alike um a ritual to follow that is not the true that is the dark side of the history let me uh, say that that is the dark side of the history and we should not repeat it in the present 
to brighten our future. If we want to have a peaceful future, make religion a binding force, not a dividing uh, object. I will invite you all to reclaim the folk wisdom. When scholars talk about education and they uh, put the numbers in front of us, yes. But having an ideal situation in the shorter period of time is very difficult. So why not claim our folk wisdom? Why not claim the wisdom which we are practicing, having, enjoying for last few centuries and on our streets? There and and for us, if we talk, we Pakistanis are talking about religious freedom. For us, there are people like me, Amir Sahab. There are examples of Hindu Brahmins, uh, uh, Husseini Brahmins in Hindus. There are so many examples to follow. So reclaiming the folk wisdom and reclaiming the cultural value of religious diversity is the solution for this problem in short term. That I believe. Thank you, Hina. I guess I am done with my 10 minutes. Thank you so much, Bisha. Wonderful thoughts that how beautifully you have connected the religion with the cultural values that we all are connected to. Us. Thank you so much. So here we have two questions for you both. So my first question is, what uh, do the term religious extremism and religious freedom means? So first, I would like to invite Dr. Akhtar. I think that's a good question. Um, so I think for, I mean, in the American context, the idea of religious freedom is the ability to practice your religion um, freely. Um, and I think that's a big, that's a big, you know, question is that how do you, um, do you feel that you are able to practice your religion openly and that it's not something that is going to result in your um, persecution by either society or the government or lead to your death? Um, and I think unfortunately for quite a number of groups here in, in the country, uh, we can't say that that exists yet. I think at an ideal level, it can. Um, but I think the idea of the freedom to be able to, to have your identity as a religious person public, um, and for that to be, even if it's not necessarily valued as the same as your own, but at least that you have the ability to, to, um, to express that and to worship in the, in the way that you would like to worship. Thank you so much, uh, Dean Lassisab. Do you want to add on this question? Uh, I guess uh, Dr. Iqbal uh, Akhtar uh, replied it very well, and uh, I will repeat my uh, stance on it, that uh, when I want my religion to be celebrated within and out as a right, that is my religious freedom. And when I don't give that right to others, that is religion, uh, religious extremism. Stay with Wonderful. So stay with us, Pisa. Uh, my next question is for you. Please let us know your experience regarding religious freedom in the US. Uh, in short, it was wonderful. Uh, I, uh, I have been in US so many times that I forget how many times in number I was there. But the wonderful experience of understanding US uh, society was my IVLP uh, visit uh, 2010, back in 2010. And the most wonderful thing which I uh, learned there about the US society on particular religious issue or religious freedom, uh, that was an understanding which the state and society equally carries. That's very important, that uh, synchronization of state and society on particular issue, and that issue was religion. Uh, that if four people, they sit together 
and they claim that they are inventing a new religion, the state and society will respect that. So the freedom on the level where people can invent a new religion or announce a new religion or a small number of group, uh, they claim that they follow a particular religion or it's until unless they are not harmful for the society as a religion, they will be accepted and respected. That was a wonderful thing which inspired me a lot. So uh, I will give same question to Dr. Akhtarsha. Um, yeah, so I think that, I think I've had a, um, a little bit of a complex relationship, I think, with the United States. Um, I think on the one hand, the type of religious diversity that exists and the openness to different religions is remarkable. I mean, in a city like Miami, you have, Jews and Hindus and Santeria and like every single religion and, and group that's there. Um, on the other hand, I also grew up after September 11th where the whole society became extremely anti-Muslim. The US had invaded Afghanistan and Iraq. I was working for the Air Force at that time. Um, and I, you know, I've been pulled off of planes. I've had all types of um, discrimination, I think, based on how I look or my name. Um, so that's also been part of it, right? Um, but I think one of the advantages of the United States is that you also have legal recourse, right? So you can sue people that there is like at least a legal and a judicial system that you can advocate for your rights. And it forced American Muslims to, to organize themselves politically and to be able to um, uh, to demand of the state the rights that they have. And American Muslims are much stronger um, because of that. So, you know, I was also working, um, I'm working with a student from UMT and she's originally from the Hazara community. And they've been treated quite badly here in Pakistan, particularly in Balochistan. They're being targeted by some of these extremist groups as well. They're being killed on a, on a you know, um, in very brutal ways. And, you know, their response is, okay, why isn't the government doing more? I mean, we're seeing that there are people that are, that are within local government that are complicit but also that one of the things that you have to do is then organize yourselves as a, as a voting bloc, as a political or as a political group to be able to demand of the state through the systems that exist, the rights that you need, right? Um, so I think that's another thing is that you're, there's, a, there's a common American saying that freedom isn't free. Um, and I think what that really means is, I mean, people use it in a military context, but I think what it really means is that whatever freedom exists for black people, for Native Americans, for people of color has been fought on a daily basis by very courageous people, whether it's for women, for any anyone. Um, and I think that that's something that I would love to be able to see nurtured here in Pakistan, that there are young people who have a and a capacity to be able to change society and that an individual can help to bring about change. I think that's a, a very powerful and important idea. So stay with us, uh, Dr. Iqbal Tisa. Uh, the next question is for you that since you are uh, here for a research, so could you please share your thoughts that how can the model of religion freedom be applied in, to Pakistan? I mean, I think probably Pearsav has a much better uh, perspective uh, than I. I mean, I think for me, I feel that one of the things that I am trying to do here um, is to develop networks across different groups in Pakistan. So I'm working across universities, which I feel the in universities can help provide the intellectual background for what this would look like. Uh, scholars and religious leaders like Bir Saab, I think are very critical in terms of the spiritual message and being able to talk and communicate these ideas at a practical level um, for people. And then you know, creating coalitions across society. And I think the other problem that we see as well is that Pakistan is not a racially divided society like America but it's a highly class stratified society. 
and people from upper class working with the lower class, that's something that's, it's, you know, the, the servant class is a very different class from the educated class. And the class issue, I think, really prevents um, uh, solidarity on these sorts of topics. So I think also addressing the class issue, um, uh, religion can also, you know, thinking about religion as a, as a medium to be able to communicate these ideas and create solidarity cl across classes is important. So, you know, like I went for Juma Namaz today and you have people from lower, from the, 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 the working class, uh, from the poorest class to the richest people. And they're all in a mosque uh, in a straight line saying namaz together. And I think that's a very important message and vision for what Islam is at its best. Perfect. So, Pim Dasadab, I want to hear from you on this question as well. And how can the model of religious freedom be applied to Pakistan? First of all, I don't believe that there is a specific ideal model of religious freedom anywhere in the world. Everyone is working with uh, with the, the efforts to bring more betterness in the model of uh, religious freedom. And you cannot import it from somewhere. It is something which should evolve from within the society. Then it's workable. Uh, we have different values, we have different culture, we have uh, different baggage of history, uh, we have different claims, historical claims, which we carry uh, proudly with ourselves. And same with the Eastern European bloc or the Euro core European bloc, or if you talk about the African bloc or Americans uh, or the Far East, the, everyone carries their own back baggage of claims, uh, cultural values, history, political scenarios, uh, and economical phenomena. So I, I, I believe that we have to evolve this model within. And the only way uh, to evolve it is developing understanding to respect others' religious thoughts. That is the only way. Thank you so much. Now it's time for the Q&A session and we're taking live questions from our audience. So here's the first question for you, Pisa, especially for you. Noor is asking, I have a question for Pisa. We are talking about religious freedom, but when someone wants to change his or her religion, like from Christianity to Muslim or Muslim to Christianity, why there is, there is so much voice? Yeah, Noor, I agree with you that it is unfortunate, by the way. It is unfortunate. It is, you carry your religion. I try to understand my, uh, if, uh, if I'm wrong, correct me. You carry your religion like yourself, right? I am right now using Samsung. If I want to switch on Apple, it is something very personal. And it has nothing to do with you, Noor. Or if you want to switch from Apple to Samsung, it has nothing to do with me. That's That should be the basic understanding. Look, we uh, there are, are many scholars, you will find that they are switching from one sect to other sect and they are claiming that they, are, they found more peace or intellectually they are more calm in this uh, uh, philosophy. So the basic understanding which we should evolve, again, I will emphasize on evolve, that let people choose the way they want to live their life and they want to celebrate their inner soul with the concept of connectivity with divine. That is their basic right. right. So the, all the chaos or all the things has... No logic, by the way. But unfortunately, right now, yes, we see it. We witness it. And that's unfortunate. So the next question is for Dr. Ibalsa. Is a need for religion net among humans? Uh, okay. That's a good question. Um, I th 
think that I think all people um, want to believe in something that is greater than themselves. I think that's something that is very deep in the human psyche. So even when we talk about Western Europe and the loss of religion, um, we talk, you know, in the academic literature, we talk about um, a God-shaped hole in the European mind. So that, you know, with the loss of religion, um, I'm sorry. Yeah. Is that is that okay? Is that better? Yes. Yeah. Okay. We cannot see you, but we can hear you. Okay. All right. Um, so I, I feel like that that is something that exists. Um, and I think there was another question in the chat about the violence of religion. Um, so I think we see that even in other ideologies, whether it's Nazism, many other ideologies can promote violence as well. So it's not just religion that's doing that, but I feel that every society, every group wants to feel that they're part of something greater. And for most traditional societies, religion was part of that. Uh, it creates identity, it creates space for people. Um, it can be creative as well. So we look at some of the greatest works of art and architecture in Western civilization and Islamic civilization there they come from the love of religion, right? Whether it's calligraphy, whether it's the beautiful mosaics of a mosque. Um, so it can be something that is life affirming that connects people from the beginning of their life to the end of their life, the rituals of death and how to deal with it, the rituals of life and birth, of marriage. Religion has is such a vast and remarkable, um, uh, you know, sort of, part of, of what it means to be human and part of the human experience. So even if people do not subscribe to religion, then they create their own secular or cultural ways or capitalist ways or any other way of being able to celebrate and explain and be part of something greater. So say that you're even, you know, you're working, um, for instance, with the American government, you work in the government and you believe in something larger, this idea of the government and that you're working for the betterment of people. Well, the idea, government is an idea itself as well, right? It's in just another idea. It's, it's nothing more than a collection of people who believe in a single idea um, and perhaps different interpretations of that idea. So I think the idea of, of something greater is something that connects us all and that's vital to what gives our life meaning. And when you don't have something greater to believe in, then there's despair and there's hope there's a loss of hope. And then, you know, that also creates its own problems. So I do believe that religion has an important part to play in, in the future of humanity. Thanks. Thank you. So Pisa, uh, the next question is for you. What is your take on recent incident of Seyalkut? That is a huge example of religious extremism. Oh, that's so unfortunate, by the way. What should be a, anyone's take on it? That's unfortunate. That's condemnable. No one can stand with that behavior. Um, that equally damaged the religious values of Pakistan. That there is no space of religious extremism. It's my principal stance that there is no space for religious extremism and terrorism in Pakistan. How could someone talk about that instance, incident in a positive way? That's strongly condemned, strongly condemned. And that uh, kind of fanatic behavior, which was adopted by that mob, uh, I will, I will urge government to bring all the culprits in the custody of law and law should act they should face the consequences that's inhuman that's inhuman so what we can do that um, as a youth because mostly uh, participants joined us are students uh, what do you think they can do to stop in these kind of incidents or how they can be a peace promoter. Don't participate in that kind of activities. 
don't give them a damn the censored word shit to these kind of activities um don't follow these kind of people don't follow and perpetuate these kind of ideologies which are extremely extremist ideologies make a calm and respectful religious society around you evolve it groom it celebrate it include other religious groups in your friend circles try to understand how they feel good about their religion and try to enjoy that as well start with the sects you have around you start with the religions you have around you start with the heritage you have around you dr sab talked about jain um, we don't have jains anymore in lahore but we have jain heritage try to own it try to respect that heritage try to celebrate that diversity we had in past and try to reclaim that diversity in future you are the ones who can bring the change the real change not the political change again there is a question for you peer sahab that how the sufism can bring peace in the society as uh, someone said if there is something wrong in democracy democracy is the tool to bring uh, to make it right so as far as i know the sufism is all about peace within yourself and when you have peace in you inside you reflect that peace outside so try to bring peace inside and that but try to bring peace inside yourself not to impose the idea of peace which you think the idea of peace on others and especially with force no try to bring peace in yourself and trust me that peace will be reflected outside and sufism it it's it's try try to disengage sufism with a religion let's try to understand sufism as sufism you will find it very cultural thing you will find it full with folk wisdom you will find it decentralized it is not centralized thing sufis are very decentralized entities uh, you you see the work of bulesha you see the work of sultan bahu that is regional domestic kind of work it is it is inspired by uh, some influence but it is not addressing masses in that influenced language influencer language they are talking in their local language they are talking about the local customs they are um, giving the example of uh, local traditions that decentralization gave sufism a strength to attract masses connect with masses and that is the key thank you so much for your um, here the last question for both of you how can we eliminate religious superiority or inferiority complex in pakistan so first i will request dr iqbal akhtar thanks um well i mean i think that there's no one magic solution um but for me i feel that um it needs to be in two levels one for me i feel like education floors and allows um, different parts of the world and and that's one way that you're able to do that programs like like the fulbright and other things are also helpful i think so education is one sense is a type of socialization and the type of socialization that we would like for our society is something that we can write into that through teacher training through curriculum 
uh, through experiences of heritage um, and, and particularly the pre-Islamic heritage of Pakistan. So that's one way of doing it. I think the other thing also is that the people who are looked up to in Pakistani society, whether it's people in government, whether it's the industrialists in this country, um, people who are successful or wealthy, um, then they also have to be able to uh, model that sort of change, right? So people are not simply acting the way that they're acting because that's how it is, is that they're reflecting the larger values of people in society and particularly those with power uh, or wealth, right, in society. And so then those models of people, um, that's something else that you, that you would need to sort of work with, um, figuring out how through messaging, Uh, we have lost your voice. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so I think one of the ways that this happens in the United States is that multiculturalism is pushed not just at a academic level and in a governmental level, but it's also pushed by industry. So uh, brands like Coke or Nike, they very clearly try to put in the, United, in the American context, people of different races on uh, advertisements, people of different body types, different religions, right? So you're constantly trying to model that diversity within the economic realm. Um, and so valuing diversity, valuing those things um, economically uh, then is also connected to the political, which is connected to the educational, and then which is connected to what Pierre Sabu probably, you know, the work, the very vital work that he's doing um, at the religious and the spiritual level. So I think in every sector of society, you need to sort of be able to model a vision and then have those visions in some sort of way connect to each other, articulating constantly this idea of multiculturalism. And that's also an evolving message. It's not something that's static and it's going to evolve and change as society changes. Thanks. Oh, no, and I would like you to repeat the question once, please. What was it exactly? I lost Same the voice. Complex. It's okay. How can we eliminate religious superiority or inferiority complex in Pakistan? Be more religious. Be more religious. And that doesn't mean that uh, uh, you claim superiority of your religion. That means respecting the other religions. Uh, the majority religion of Pakistan is Islam. Okay. But Islam is all about equality. Claim the religious equality. Provide the religious equality to others. Be good Muslim. What Islam is all about? Tolerance. Practice that. What is your claim about your religion? That that religion is preacher of love. Okay, show it to the world. Love others. Tolerate others' thoughts. Be humble with others. You don't need to claim your right of religious freedom in Pakistan as a Muslim. But there are other religious groups. Give the same right to them as well. So be more religious. Don't be more lo lovable. Start loving others more. Respecting others' thoughts more. Giving and creating space for their thoughts and practices. Whatever religion they follow, start respecting that. That is the only way. Otherwise, and strongly, I will strongly recommend and request state has nothing doing with religion. State cannot hold a strong say on religious diversity. Okay, this is good or this is bad. Every single citizen in the state who is following a religion, he, she should have a complete freedom of religion. And state should make sure that Every single citizen of the state is enjoying the religious freedom. Thank you so much, Dr. Saab. It's a wonderful discussion with you both, and you have highlighted very important topics. 
and share your best practices that how we can promote peace. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Iqbal Lakhter sir, and Peace Sayyid Mudassir Nadar Shah sir, for your time and special thanks to our wonderful audience for joining us today. For more updates on upcoming activities, please stay connected to our Facebook page. Thank you and goodbye.